Hi, everyone, and welcome to Radio Cloud Native from Mirantis, where we break down the week's news on Kubernetes, the cloud native landscape, and the wider world of tech. I'm Eric Gregory, and my co-host Nick Chase is out on a well-deserved break this week. So we've got a shorter solo show today, but hopefully an exciting one. We'll be breaking down some of the changes coming to Kubernetes 1.25 and walking through some of the latest news in the worlds of open source and security. So let's jump right in. Kubernetes 1.25 is set to drop in about two weeks on August 23rd, so now's not a bad time to look ahead at some forthcoming features and some forthcoming removals. So first, just as a background, the latest version will be built with Minty Fresh Go 1.19, which was released on August 2nd. We chatted about that a bit last week. Speaking of changes under the hood, 1.25 marks a big milestone with Cgroup v2 support hitting general availability. Cgroups are a key functionality of the Linux kernel that underlies containers and container orchestration. They're the mechanism by which processes are organized and apportioned resources in a configurable way. Most of our core cloud native technologies were built on Cgroup v1, but after the release of Cgroup v2 back in 2016, we're just now hitting the point where you can use v2 with Kubernetes in production. The exp expanded flexibility of Cgroups v2 opens up some new options for Kubernetes users, including notably running non-root Kubernetes components and more easily running rootless containers. Those are some essential capabilities for security purposes, so it'll be great to have those ready to utilize in production in a reliable and relatively straightforward way. Cgroups v2 also allows for full implementation of eBPF, or Extended Berkeley Packet Filter, the kernel functionality that sits behind technology like Cilium. So with Cgroups v2 enabled, you can use the full mighty powers of Cilium, like straight up replacing Proxy to facilitate more performant networking and add load balancing. So, Cgroup v2 is a big deal all by itself. Also hitting general availability are ephemeral containers. This is a type of container intended for debugging rather than running applications. An ephemeral container isn't tied to the lifecycle of their pod, it, it won't restart automatically, and doesn't have any guarantees of resource availability. It's like a little maintenance ghost flitting into a pod to troubleshoot. Ephemeral containers can be particularly useful when you're using minimal images without shells, which is often sensible for speed and for security, but can hamper you a bit in debugging. We've had this feature for a while, but now it's ready for prime time. Hitting alpha is a new ability to implement user namespaces within pods. This is distinct from the cluster namespaces used by Kubernetes. Instead, these are Linux namespaces applied at the pod level. The main goal here is to provide an additional level of isolation between the pod and the host, with an eye towards security and vulnerabilities associated with container and pod escape. With user namespaces, a process in a pod can have a different user or group ID than the process running on the node, on the host. That process might have full privileges on the pod within the user namespace, but if it escapes out into the host, it will only have limited privileges there. That can really mitigate a lot of existing vulnerabilities. So while this feature is just an alpha, it's set to give us a way to add an extra layer of security to pods that might need to be highly privileged. The last big 1.25 item to discuss today isn't a new feature or graduation, but a removal. The pod security policy API will be gone, gone, gone as of Kubernetes 1.25 after being deprecated back in 1.21. Pod security policy was meant to provide a way to define rules for a set of pods capabilities, but ultimately a lot of folks found that it was too confusing and encouraged overly broad defaults. Now it's being replaced with the pod security admission controller, so anyone still using pod security policy will want to migrate. The Kubernetes docs include some good instructions for migrating. We'll link those in the chat for live viewers and the show notes for podcast listeners. All right, turning from Kubernetes to the wider open source world, Last week, GitLab reportedly mulled and then promptly scrapped plans to delete repositories that had been inactive for a year. The register broke the story of the company's initial plans to remove inactive repos, reporting that these quiet repositories account for about a quarter of GitLab's hosting costs at a value of about $1 million per year. Uh, Producer Nick and I were talking about that number just before the show, and you know, it's not nothing, but it's also... It's also kind of a joke in Austin Powers, right? Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, what, what did we say? We said it was uh, probably more than they spend on coffee, but less than they spend on snacks. So worth keeping in mind. You can understand why they might want to slough off those costs, but also they're, they're operating in some, some pricey territory. Uh, 
In any case, under the proposed policy, users would have been given warning of, quote, weeks or months, unquote, before deletion, and activities such as comments, commits, or new issues would have been sufficient to reset the 12-month countdown clock. Once revealed by the register, apparently based on sources and documents from within the company, the plan met with outcry from users. Some noted that many open source projects reach a state of completion. They do what they need to do without issues and might be widely or sporadically used, but occupy an important position in the open source ecosystem, perhaps a pivotal position as a dependency for something else. Within a day and reportedly on account of online outrage, GitLab reversed course, stating in a tweet that they would instead develop a system to archive less frequently used repos to object storage. The details of the new plan are still unclear and presumably still in flux given the swift about face last week, so we'll just have to keep our eyes open and see where they land. But this story comes amid wider upheaval in the Git repository hosting landscape. GitHub Copilot's utilization of user code for AI-based code recommendations has rankled some users and signaled Microsoft's willingness to experiment with the platform and its data in the interest of monetization. GitLab is clearly looking at ways to reduce costs, and all this demonstrates that massive volumes of open source work are sitting on edifices of free tier hosting that aren't just going to sit there unchanged forever. But one thing that you can depend on continuing into eternity, cyber attacks. This month, Twilio disclosed that they suffered a social engineering attack that gained access to employee and customer accounts. The, user, the attack used text messages to employees, which is kind of a cruel irony, matching names to phone numbers and prompting those employees to, quote, change their login information with malicious links. Curiously, Twilio alludes to unspecified other companies being hit by similar attacks, but we've seen no similar disclosures from other organizations as of yet. Twilio says they've contacted customers who may have had information compromised, but the takeaway here is universal. Social engineering attacks can be pretty sophisticated, sometimes using personal information you might not expect. So individuals need to be super, super skeptical and cautious, and organizations need to issue very specific guidance about the kinds of communications that they're going to send. Now, you know, Twilio has been a good corporate citizen here. In cybersecurity world, transparency helps to protect everyone. Often the transparency is voluntary, but recently we've seen initiatives to enforce incident reporting from a couple different agencies of the U.S. federal government. Protocol reported on the very distinct reactions garnered by initiatives from CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, and the Securities and Exchange Commission. We'll start with the spicy one, the SEC. The SEC's proposed rules would require businesses to report on major cyber attacks within four business days, which has caused a great deal of consternation among security officers who say that often the facts of the matter aren't known within that time frame, and enforced reporting could create more confusion than clarity. This could also require reporting before mitigation, which might be downright counterproductive. Meanwhile, CISA leaders like Director Jen Easterly and former Director Chris Krebs have cultivated a good deal of credibility in the wider security community, and they're proposing a different sort of paradigm that many security folks regard as more sophisticated. Currently, CISA is starting a rulemaking process under the Cyber Incident Reporting for Critical Infrastructure Act of 2022, which is intended to ultimately produce a set of reporting rules covering major incidents affecting critical infrastructure sectors. The broad proposal outlines a process by which the specifics of many incidents would be reported to CISA, but then relayed anonymously to the public. These rules tend to be a little more subtle and specific and developed in partnership with the target industries to the extent that they've been developed already. And CISA is hoping that that will make them more effective. Currently, according to CISA, the government is only being made aware of a tiny fraction of incidents with tiny fraction being a quote there. So, there's a big tangle of incentives and directives here. Companies are incentivized to be extra cautious and some might well prefer not to talk about incidents at all. The broader security environment depends though on reporting, on transparency, uh, but we have a confusion of potential regulations in play. Indeed, the snarl of regulations is worse than just two dueling sets of proposals. Right now, there are almost two dozen sets of rules circulating among federal agencies, either finalized or in development on top of final or proposed rules at the state level. The good news is that this confusion hasn't gone unnoticed. Cyber incident reporting for critical, the Cyber Incident Reporting for Critical Infrastructure Act also created a cybersecurity council housed under the Department of Homeland Security assigned to synchronize federal rules. CISA describes the synchronization as a top priority, but it remains to be seen how that will play out. And on that note of resounding uncertainty, 
we're done for today. <laughs> Nick should be back with us next week. Thanks to Nika for her production wizardry, and thanks to Lewis and DJ for their work on social and video. If you're tuning in live, you can also catch us after the fact in podcast form wherever fine podcasts are found. If you're tuning into the podcast, you can also join us for the live recording every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern through the Mirantis LinkedIn page. However you've joined us, I'd like to thank you, and we'll see you next time. Take care. <laughs>